catch me hollering at the moon. What is it like visiting five different countries in 16 days to attend 17 theme parks and ride 94 new roller coasters? In August, I went on my first ever European theme park trip, visiting parks in Germany, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and Poland, including some of the oldest, strangest, and highest rated theme parks in the entire world. This was by far the biggest theme park trip I've ever done. And today, I'm gonna give you my thoughts on all 17 of these European theme parks. I will do a full review of a few of these parks eventually, so comment which park you'd like to see a full video on, and whichever one gets the most likes is the one I'll review first. Don't forget to pick up your copy of my strategic theme park guide in the first link of the description, and let's fire up a lightning round and talk about some of Europe's most interesting theme parks. I flew into Hamburg to kick off the first leg of the trip in northern Germany, and day one was spent at Haida Park, about an hour south of Hamburg, where we withstood an almost constant downpour of rain, which unfortunately would become a very common theme of this trip. Haida Park has a very picturesque setting surrounding a large lake in the center of the park, and it's notable for a few of its rides eye-capturing thematic elements, like the wooden giant and flamethrower on Colossus, and the Kraken Mouth flyby and splashdown on Kraken. But the big hitter at Haida Park is Colossus, the Intamin prefabricated wooden coaster. Now it's no El Toro by any means, but after a complete retracking in 2018, it runs a million times smoother than its American counterpart. In the cold and rain, Colossus's pacing left a little to be desired, but it did show some flashes of being an elite wooden coaster with some very strong airtime moments. The rest of the coaster lineup was also pretty solid. You've got Desert Race, the Intamin hydraulic launch coaster, which was a sleeper hit, and I really enjoyed both Bobbin, the mock bobsled coaster, and Fluke der Damon in the B&M wing coaster. Overall, Haida was just a very well-rounded feeling park to kick off the trip, and a good introduction to the level of elevated theming and ambiance that's unique to these European parks. Day 2 was spent at Hansa Park, located right on the Baltic Sea, and the best way I can describe the overarching theme of Hansa Park is basically a modern depiction of the different eras of medieval Europe, which is truly one of the the most badass things you could theme a park to. And that theme is best embodied by the two major coasters here, The Oath of Karnan and Escape of Novgorod. Karnan is a Gerslauer Infinity hyper coaster and one of the top five tallest coasters in Europe, but yet it's built inside of a literal castle. Karnan's storytelling, thematics, and surprise ride elements make it one of the most euphoric coaster experiences in the world. But outside of its world-class theming, it's also just a damn good roller coaster on its own merit. It is super intense with some crazy transitions and it ended up being one of the best rides of the trip. Novgorod is similar to Karnan in the fact that it has some surprises and insanely good thematic elements, as well as a super kicky launch and some fun inversions. If you ever plan on going to Hansa Park, I highly highly suggest you do not look up any spoilers, especially for these two coasters. Going into this trip, I intentionally did as little research as possible on all of these parks, just so that I could experience them fresh, but I'm especially glad I got to fully appreciate Karnan and Novgorod without knowing any spoilers going in. Another standout attraction at Hansa Park is Highlander, the current highest freestanding drop tower in the world at 390 feet tall. It gives amazing views of the Baltic, and you're just falling forever. This is a top 5 drop tower. Overall, the medieval vibe of Hansa Park really resonated with me, and on top of that, it's just a lovely park, one I would definitely go out of my way to experience again. Day 3 was mostly a travel day to Copenhagen, but we traveled pretty far out of our way to visit the original Legoland Park in Billund, Denmark, where the company was originally founded. Now admittedly, our stop was mostly motivated by the park's four coaster credits, which included the typical dragon and wild mouse coasters you see at the other Legoland parks, but also a pair of unique Zier coasters. Flying Eagle with this front car that I absolutely adored, and Polar Express, which ended up being a very solid family coaster with a surprise ride element at the end. We ended up only staying about two hours because the place was completely slammed from the get-go, but overall it was a very nice little park that felt pretty comparable to the Legoland parks in the States. Day 4 was the first day of a 10-day bus tour organized by Coaster Crew, where a group of 70 of us traveled all across Scandinavia going from park to park. 
And our first park of this leg was Bakken, just north of Copenhagen. Bakken is the oldest amusement park in the world, with its origins dating back to 1583. And it totally fits the bill of the world's oldest park. Bakken is pretty much a gathering place in a public forest that gradually had more and more attractions added, until it kind of accidentally became an amusement park. It has a super unique 1-2 Intamin coaster punch of Tornado, the viral spinning coaster that, up until this year, was the only of its kind in the world, and Mine Train Ulven, also extremely rare as only one of three Intamin Mine Trains ever built. While Tornado did live up to its reputation as a bonkers and out of control ride, it was Ulven that was my favorite coaster in the park and one of the more underrated coasters of the trip, with its tight and whippy transitions and amazing terrain usage. With all kinds of independent shops and restaurants, Bakken feels more like a rendezvous or a permanent fair rather than a traditional amusement park, which again and totally fits the bill of the oldest amusement park in the world. We went from a morning at the oldest amusement park in the world straight into a night at the third oldest amusement park in the world, Tivoli Gardens in central Copenhagen. Tivoli Gardens has that classic pleasure garden feel and is one of the most beautiful theme parks I've been to. But as a landlocked park right in the middle of a major city, Tivoli is understandably devoid of any standout roller coaster. The most visually striking and best themed coaster in the park is the compact BM floorless coaster Damon Inn. But the best one was Rushaban Inn, a brakeman operated wooden coaster with a ton of great airtime and currently holding the title of the third oldest roller coaster in the world. Tivoli Gardens is much more of a walk around, eat and drink, and take in the ambiance kind of place rather than a traditional amusement park. Because of this, entry to the park and ride passes are sold separately, and it serves as almost a town square of sorts for Copenhagen, which is something you don't really see at amusement parks in the United States. Day 5 started at a place called Bon Bon Land, and Bon Bon Land is batch crazy. This is not only the most bizarre park I've ever been to, but one of the strangest places I've visited in general. And for that reason, it ended up being one of my favorite stops of the entire trip. Between rides like the Water Rat and the Farting Dog Roller Coaster, it has this wacky yet endearing quirkiness, and every ride is just so tacky with some kind of gag. It's just hilarious. But on on top of that, Bon Bon Land has some real coasters too, like the first ever Gerslauer Eurofighter was built here, and they also have probably the best Gerslauer spinning coaster on the planet, which was honestly an even better spinning coaster than Tornado the day prior. Between the goofy characters and toilet humor, Bon Bon Land is just so charming and campy, the park is almost so bad that it's good in a weird way, and I just laughed like a child the entire time we were here. The second park of day 5 was Tivoli Freeheaden. Tivoli Freeheaden has the only SCAD tower currently left operating in the entire world. SCAD stands for Suspended Catch Air Device, and that's exactly what it is. A 100 foot free fall at 55 miles per hour with no harness into a suspended net below. And this is not only hands down the most terrifying attraction I have ever done, but also probably the scariest 7 seconds of my life. But beyond the SCAD tower, Tivoli Freeheaden left a lot to be desired. It did have a couple good flat rides, but coaster-wise, we're currently just working with a spinning wild mouse, dragon wagon, and an SPF Visa spinner. Tivoli Freeheaden is a very small, albeit beautiful park, and they do have a new Eurofighter opening next year, but I'm not going to be in too much of a rush to get back here. Day 6 was spent at Jur's Summerland. Outside of Paraten, the Intamin Megalite coaster, Jur's Summerland was not on my radar at all, and was a park I knew pretty much nothing about before our visit, but it ended up being one of the very best parks of the trip. Jers is a super clean and beautiful park in a wooded setting, all the lands are really well themed and updated, and everything about this park just felt really nice and well maintained. It also has a very well rounded coaster collection, headlined by a trio of Intamins. You have Dragakongen, a suspended family coaster that probably should not be classified as a family coaster, Juvelin, a family straddle coaster that definitely should not be classified as a family coaster, and Piratin, a megalite which has one of the most perfect and succinct layouts just jam-packed with airtime. Basically just a miniature I-305 and one of my personal favorite coasters on the trip. Other highlights were Thor's Hammer, the Gerslauer Bobsled which was a ton of fun, and Tiger in the massive Intamin Gyro Spin, which honestly may be the best flat ride I have ever been on. All in all, Jers is just a lovely, modern feeling park with so many good rides. Six days in, the trip was going suspiciously smoothly, and despite dealing with rain almost every day, 
day, we hadn't experienced any missed credits or major ride closures at all. But man, did things take a turn for the worse on day 7. A storm named Hans hit Scandinavia and brought the worst rain and winds the region had seen in 25 years. And from there, all hell broke loose. The worst day of this storm fell on day 7, which was spent at Farup Summerland, the northernmost park in Denmark. Amidst the 40 mile per hour winds and constant rain, we were very fortunate that Farup still opened for us. But the park's three marquee coasters were not able to operate due to wind, which means we missed out on Falcon, the SNS wooden coaster, Lynette, a launch Gerslauer Eurofighter, and most painfully, Phonics, the new and incredible looking Vekoma sit down thrill coaster, which was the biggest gut punch of the trip. But as you can see in some of these clips, it was pretty understandable why these rides couldn't operate. Hell, it was so windy that the wild mouse wasn't even making it all the way to the lift hill and the employees had to get out and manually push it there. And we still got to experience rides like Savin, which was my first ever Vekoma Junior Boomerang, and the Vekoma Suspended Family Coaster Orkanen, both of which were fun with pretty cool settings. And while Farouk was an extremely pretty park, unfortunately I wasn't able to get a good feel for it with the weather being so poor and missing out on its top three coasters. Now if you thought that sounded bad, it was about to get a whole lot worse. Because from here, we were supposed to take an overnight ferry from Denmark up through the Skagerrak to Oslo, Norway for our next park the following day. But because of this storm, every single ferry was cancelled, meaning the only way to get to our next park in Norway the following day was to drive 13 hours overnight all the way back down through Denmark, all the way up through western Sweden, and finally into Norway. So after a 13 hour overnight bus ride, day 8 was spent at Tusen the largest theme park in Norway. As someone with Norwegian ancestors, I was still pretty excited to visit Tusen Free, despite all the obstacles we had to go through to get there. And there were two coasters there that made the haul all the way to Norway more than worth it. First, Speed Monster, an intimate hydraulic launch coaster with some snappy transitions and inversions. And Storm, a coaster that was definitively the sleeper hit of the entire trip. Storm is new for 2023 and is the prototype of Gerslauer's new inverted coaster model. It has strong launches, intense inversions, and this one crazy airtime hill which is one of the best ejector moments I've ever experienced. I'm talking like El Toro level ejector. I think it might be the best inverted coaster I've ever ridden. Tucson Freed is a very mountainous park, and it makes good use of its elevation by building rides that utilize the terrain well, like this Thor themed dark ride that's built into the side of a cliff, and Speed Monster which sits on top of the hill where you enter the park, and has its six signature Norwegian loop that interacts with the famous escalator you take at the park's front entrance. Overall, I love Tucson Freed's setting, and it's just an overall nice park. The coaster lineup is very hit or miss, with a couple of them being remarkably bad, but in my eyes, it has a huge winner of a headlining coaster in Storm. The first two-day park of the trip was at one of Europe's most historic amusement parks, Liseberg, which was celebrating its 100th anniversary. We stayed on site the duration of our visit at the brand new Grand Curiosa hotel, which was a very relaxing and much needed pit stop after the debacles of the past few days. In terms of prestige, Liseberg was easily the most prominent park on this trip, and is considered by many to be a top 5 theme park in all of Europe. And I would say that Liseberg more than lived up to that reputation. First of all, Liseberg has an incredible two-headed coaster monster. You have Helix, the mock rides coaster that navigates the park's hilly terrain with multiple intense launches and seven inversions, and Helix Helix just perfectly balances inversions, airtime, and intensity. And on top of being one of the best inversion based roller coasters I've been on, it has such a unique cue and a custom soundtrack that perfectly builds anticipation. And then you have Balder, another Intamin prefabricated wooden coaster. Balder is super compact and basically does a figure eight around itself several times. I did end up preferring Colossus over Balder, just because Balder had less airtime and a bit of a repetitive layout. But nonetheless, it's still a a great wooden coaster that will give you some standing airtime. Beyond that, you have a very strong supporting cast, with rides like Valkyria, the custom B&M dive coaster, and Liesberg Bonin, one of the more underrated coasters of the trip. And even Luna, the Vacoma family boomerang, had an incredible setting. And then you have two Intamin monstrosities, Loki, another massive gyro spin, and Atmosphere, the former observation tower retrofitted into a 381 foot tall drop tower. But the best part about Liseberg is the atmosphere. Located right in Gothenburg, the park has this tangible energy and hum to it. And with all the rides
slides stacked right on top of each other. It's just this constant organized chaos while you're walking around. With no shortage of amazing attractions, a world-class ambiance, and a chance to spend two whole days there enjoying everything it had to offer without ever feeling bored, Liseberg was objectively the most well-rounded park of the trip. Just an incredible place that I would recommend to anyone whether you enjoy rides or not. Unfortunately, the second major park-related bust of the trip was the beginning of day 11 at Skara Summerland. Skara Summerland is famously the home of Tranin, the world's only SNS freefly coaster that's basically the deranged love child of a bobsled and a swinging suspended coaster, where the track inverts multiple times without actually taking riders upside down. And we were supposed to have morning ERT on Tranin, but when we arrived, we found out that it was down for the day, along with their powered coaster and fun time booster. So with so many of the marquee attractions closed, we basically just got the spinning coaster credit and then hit the road. So unfortunately, Skara Summerland is another park I have to reserve judgment on. The second stop of day 11 was Colmarden Wildlife Park, and we ended up making an additional stop here on the morning of day 12 as well. Colmarden has two main claims to fame. It's the largest zoo in Scandinavia and home to the tallest wooden roller coaster in the world, Wildfire, a topper track coaster from RMC. Wildfire has a jaw-dropping setting and is one of the most picturesque coasters in the entire world. In my opinion, this is one of RMC's strongest layouts. Wildfire is lengthy with plenty of variety, including solid airtime, good inversions, and those crazy tight transitions. Colmarden also takes great care of it, as it runs infinitely smoother than its two sister topper track coasters in the United States, Goliath and Outlaw Run. That being said, Wildfire didn't quite live up to my high expectations I had. When you're riding it, you're kind of expecting Outlaw Run's out of control pacing, but Wildfire doesn't ever quite get to that level. It's still an amazing wooden coaster, but it's kind of a bummer because if it ran like five miles an hour faster, with that layout, it would easily be the best wooden roller coaster in the world. Another must do at Colmarden is the world's first cable car safari, where you get these stunning views of Wildfire with the Bravican Bay in the background, and it dangles you up close and personal with five different sections of animals from around the world. Colmarden's unique mix of wildlife and wildfire was a very welcome change of pace at this point of the trip, and with it being pretty reasonably close to Stockholm, it's definitely worth going out of your way to experience. The night of day 12 brought our travels to central Stockholm, to our last Scandinavian park, and last park of the group portion of the trip, Gronalund. Gronalund is another one of these landlocked city center parks located right on the water, and because of this, every single ride is extremely compact and built right on top of one another. Coaster-wise, the marquee attraction is Monster, a super compact B&M invert with an underground station, which really kind of acts as the heartbeat of this park. And then there's Insane, an Intamin Zaxpin that I was a little terrified to ride due to past experiences on this coaster, but it actually ended up being tolerable, albeit very intense. They also hilariously have the world's tallest wild mouse coaster, which honestly was pretty good. We did unfortunately miss out on two of the coasters here, Jetline, which is an old Schwarzkopf retrofitted by Zierer, which suffered a derailment earlier in the summer and tragically claimed a life, and Twister, a Gravity Group wooden coaster which was getting a retrack. The other big hitter here is Icarus, a 311 foot tall Intamin drop tower that tilts you 100 degrees straight down that has one of the latest brake sequences I've ever experienced. Basically a better version of Falcon's Fury at Busch Gardens Tampa. Grunalund shared a lot of similarities to Tivoli Gardens, with kind of that old school theme park pleasure garden feel, and more of a emphasis on atmosphere rather than rides. Overall, just a very cool and classic feeling park. Day 13 was mainly a travel day, as we did some sightseeing in Stockholm before catching a flight to Krakow, Poland for the next set of parks. Days 14 and 15 were spent at Energylandia, the self-proclaimed roller coaster capital of Europe with an astonishing 17 roller coasters and counting. The best way to describe Energylandia is basically a coaster enthusiast heaven. Not only does it have two of the very best roller coasters in the world, but also just an endless buffet of credits to stat pad your coaster count. At the top of the lineup is Zadra, the RMC Hyper Hybrid Coaster, which to me is basically Iron Gwazi on steroids and probably the best paced roller coaster I've ever been on. It just hauls through each of its elements to the point where it feels borderline unsafe at times. Then you have Hyperion, the current second tallest roller coaster in Europe. This intimate hyper coaster is an intense speed machine with a 
ton of good airtime. Both Hyperion and Zadra ranked as top 5 coasters of the entire trip. And then on top of that, you have two good Vekoma sit down thrill coasters in Abyssus and Formula, and the world's tallest water coaster in Speed. Even though it is top heavy, it's just a stacked coaster lineup. A main complaint of Energylandia is its dichotomy between the front and the back of the park, where the front is kind of filled with corny themed fair rides and kiddie coasters, while the back has these two elite themed sections in Dragon Zone and Aqualantis, with these amazing and beautifully themed attractions. And that is definitely a fair criticism. I mean, this park literally has four different variants of the exact same Vekoma Junior Coaster model. But honestly, after you just zoom through all the credits and get your rides in on Hyperion at the front of the park, there's really no reason to leave the back of the park anyways. Despite its flaws, I genuinely loved Energylandia. I think you just kind of have to appreciate it for what it is, which is basically the Six Flags Magic Mountain of Europe and one of the best roller coaster parks in the world. The 16th and final day of the trip started just a few minutes down the road from Energylandia at Zaderland, which is part animatronic dinosaur park and part children's amusement park. Obviously, we were there for the two coaster credits, a dragon wagon, and a wacky worm, but we did end up taking a lap around the large animatronic park, which was interesting. The second park of the day and the final park of the trip was Legendia in Kaju. And I wish I could say that Legendia was a strong ending to the trip, but this was a very underwhelming park. The main draw of Legendia is obviously Lek Coaster, a Vekoma sit-down thrill coaster that many people say is one of the most intense coasters in all of Europe. And while Lek Coaster was certainly very good, I didn't really find it that much better than Abyssus right down the road. And beyond Lek Coaster, this place was pretty much a dump. Coaster-wise, they have this very strange double loop coaster that was closed, two separate Zyklon galaxies, one of which was standing but not operating, and the other that kept closing every 15 minutes and was literally running only one four-person train. So we just didn't end up riding. The other good ride in this park is an indoor trackless dark ride, which actually ended up being very good. And it has this amazing looking show building that you enter, but then you literally queue for it in the middle of a restaurant with people eating. And then after that, the line takes you through the middle of an arcade. It's just very bizarre. Legendia is also where you find that viral bike loop ride, which I did not end up trying, but looked pretty cool, I guess. I don't know, Legendia does have a nice setting, but between the closed rides, overgrown midways, poor operations, it was just a very sloppy and kind of gross feeling park. That is all 17 parks. Make sure to stay tuned to your shorts feed for more content from these parks, and don't forget to comment down below which one you want full reviews on.